All right, uh, we have the same people we had before, or any new joiners? Or so we, we uh, just so we, we kind of change things up a little bit. Ron's and my talks were very similar, and so what we're what we're doing is uh, we kind of before lunch I went through the uh, extending SMP using log match and uh, also using uh, the BSF monitor and kind of over kind of an overview of what we kind of view strange data as. And then basically the, the, the gist of that is that strange data is you know the stuff that's not easily exposed to OpenMS. You know, OpenMS has a lot of ways to gather data, to do polling. Um, and uh, so sometimes you need to use some scripts to get there. Um, and uh, so we kind of talked about how that's done and, and what you can do with that. Um, during this, uh, we have an hour and a half remaining of our session. What we're thinking we'll do is uh, Ron has some stuff that he wants to share that he's done using um, XML Flecker. Correct. Um, and some scripts that he's written that, that process the data from an API for EMC storage. And then uh, we'll use XML Flecker to grab that data from there. Um, and then what we're hoping to do is kind of get some other use cases that people have used for, for similar ways of doing this. Um, if we get, you know, maybe one or two of you to come up and, and share those, that'd be nice. Uh, because, uh, you know, somebody was saying over lunch, you know, everybody uses OpenMS in a slightly different way. Or not even slightly. In a completely different way. Um, and that's what's really kind of cool about the tools. It's a great platform. And, and uh, I think uh, I think if, if we can get some more, more people to share, I think that's where people are going to get a lot of value. The other thing is if somebody has a scenario that they're trying to work through, that'd be great. You know, you've got a lot of expertise in this room. Um, and if we don't have the expert in the room, I know how to get them. Uh, and then with that, I'll turn it over to Ron. Hi, I'm uh, Ron Roskins. Um, I am a Unix systems administrator for a company called BI Worldwide, and I just stole a little bit off of our corporate website. But uh, at BI Worldwide, our mission is to produce measurable results for our clients by driving and sustaining engagement with their employees, channel partners, and consumers. It's a lot of big speak for we want to uh, help employees get things done and have uh, also for the employers make sure that they're, they're earning money uh, through sales and, and other, other things. Uh, some of the aspects of that are a rewards program where, where you gain credits for, for being recognized by other people in the company. Um, another example would be automotive sales where the, the dealerships and the, and, the, and the sales folks there earn, earn points for, for each sale and stuff and then they're able to, to spend that, those credits on merchandise <coughs> or travel or other things. Um, for where I came into with OpenMS is I, we were developing our new systems running Solaris 10 and we were going to do a highly virtualized environment where each application that we would deploy out on these would run in a Solaris zone running on a JVM and we thought that would be really good. Uh, then we started doing some number crunching and figured out that we could only run with uh, with a server having a limit of 256 gigabytes of RAM if you needed to have JVMs that were significantly bigger on the order of one, one to four gigabytes in, in memory size that there would be issues with that. So we had started to aggregate some of those down into s smaller uh, JVMs, but that still also causes problems. Um, Solaris 10 is still using that SNMP 5.0.9, and there were significant performance problems that we started to encounter later on in our development and operation of the system. We were at a point where we were running 120 plus zones on a server, and that's pretty much the limit of what we were able to run on the server. 
as far as uh, all the memory was pretty much used by all of the applications running on it. Uh, had significant problems just getting open mess to do data collection on the system as it would time out <coughs> trying to do data collections and or if it was able to do some of the data collections it would actually take longer than some of the default uh, polling cycles for uh, five minutes and stuff. Um, significantly the HR storage table out there was very large, had 1700 plus entries in the table and just doing a bulk walk of that table on Solaris from a command line would take 20 plus minutes to complete. So obviously we, we found that that wasn't going to be a solution for us for being able to get performance metrics from our systems and be able to analyze and look at what things were at. Um, so we look, did look at S NMPD and seeing what available options were available there. Um, exec was where you do a single line and get a single value back but that would have meant a, a very significantly large uh, NetS NMP config and it wasn't, uh, so I didn't really look at doing that too much. Looked at doing the pass persist a little bit, but that was, what I found was difficult about some of the NetS NMP extensions and stuff is that they didn't really have good documentation on how to do things and finding example scripts and other things like that out on the internet were not very, very easy to find. Um, didn't want to do a dynamic module where I would compile something. Um, I'm not really a, a C programmer by trade, so developing something like that that could cause SNMPD to crash and cause me to have to log in and do additional work wasn't something that I would find fun. Tried running later versions of NetSNMP but had issues just beyond just getting it to compile where we would actually have points in time where if you did try to use it, it would actually just straight up hang when you try to do a, a walk or something on it. Um, at that time, I also looked at using the, the HTTP collector for doing some of the collections thinking, hey, maybe I can write out a, a large file of data and be able to pull that data into OpenMS4 for, for data collection. Um, but the HTTP collector had what I found were a uh, few things that were kind of difficult to do. Uh, there is a single regular expression that you write for a page and that uh, I would found would, would get to be very verbose because if you go beyond eight or 10 regular expressions of what you want to find in the group pattern, it uh, would get to be pretty large. And when you're dealing with a, a node with a zone list of over 120, that was going to be a very, very large regular expression pattern to make. Um, it's also a single set of values in that there's the group that you find in the page. And there was, so there's no aspect of being able to do a resource type which would let you group together uh, values from it. Essentially, the, with uh, SNMP you have a table and you have an index and that's, your, so you're able to have things keyed off of that for each of the values out there. So that became the impetus for the XML collector. Some of the good things about the way that the XML collector is built right now is that it does use XPath expressions for all types, meaning that it's very linear in how you want to get down to each of the components inside the XML file. It's also, you can do key value, getting your, your resource types, in, um, your key value it, for each individual value. You can also do the resource groups where you get a, take a, an index and get keys and values be, beyond that 
Um, and it was also significantly faster than SNMP, so it was able to, to complete some of the collections that we were looking at doing. Um, some of the bad things about the XML collector, if you're looking at using it right now, is that it does have a significantly higher amount of CPU usage in, in its model. Um, it currently uses the DOM model for parsing the XML that comes in, <coughs> and that has significant memory requirements above and beyond just the straight data inside the XML. Um, also struggled with a very interesting use case with it where occasionally for the, uh, for the collections, the, we somehow lose the last byte, or say the last byte, but the, the XML stream would never fully be, be uh, pulled off the network, and so we would occasionally get data collection errors where that would, would be an issue for us. So some of those things have been fixed in later versions of the XML collector. There's now support for compressed data, so you're able to take that original XML file and compress it either at the server level, or you can also have it uh, um, pull it down from the server from uh, and store it in a file on the local system. Uh, it has support for XLT, being able to pre-process the file after you have downloaded it from the server, which gives you the ability to have a multi-megabyte file come down from wherever you're trying to pull the data from and process some of that information out before going through the, the later on data collections. And there's also a pluggable handle, handler for parsing of the data. I will mention here that uh, the, there is a HTTP processor for the XML collector, so you can actually parse your HTML files with the XML processor or XML collector instead of the HTTP collector. So um, I believe it still does the, the regular <coughs> expression. I think it does the regular expressions here too, but you can also, uh, it's, it's an alternative to, to the other one. Um, it's, uh, been pretty interesting to you. So one of the things that uh, that I was doing with after I found that NetSMP wasn't going to be working for us, um, I believe that was still in the time when Sun was Sun and not Oracle. And uh, I had opened up a support case with, or with Sun on getting a fix in for this. Um, However, it took them a little bit of time to, to track down what the issue was, um, and they have not yet fully fixed it. They, are, they were trying to get some of the, the fix that they had written to push to upstream, but that work hasn't uh, proceeded up any further there. I'm not sure if they were able to push it further into other into the later release of, of Solaris 11 or into a later version of NetS and MP. Um, but I imagine that work, that work is still ongoing for them. Um, so I had to find a way of taking data off of the Solaris system and being able to essentially replicate some of the, the things that NetS and MP provides via the, the interface table and the HR storage table and push that out to, uh, to an XML file then that I was able to, to read from the remote server. Did went, went through a, a couple different iterations of how I wanted to, to model the data that was coming through in the XML. Um, but it was, uh, there were a few other operational type issues that I wanted to make certain that uh, weren't, wasn't going to be a problem for us. I didn't want to have a, a very 
large delay in processing of the XML. So I have had written the script to run as a cron job on the system so that it would always store the XML file out there. And as the as my OpenMS system would request the file, that it would always get a static copy of the file. I didn't want it to run as a CGI script because when I was running it, there were times that I would find that it would take up to a minute to run, and I didn't want want to have my OpenMS system be dependent upon that that time of, of gathering the data before it would be written out to the file. Um, I also wanted to have have the ability to store the different types of data from the system, store in some of the, the interface data that the Solaris case stat information puts out, store in the CPU information that uh, stores out, um, and then being able to get the various information for the Solaris zones that were run on the, on the system, because uh, NetS and MPD, the not so much a, an issue with Netison and PD, but with Solaris, it doesn't give you granular information to say, this is how much CPU I'm using in my specific zone. When you're accessing a lot of the data for the, the interface table from the individual Solaris 10 zones, they would all report back, this is how much data is going over my interface. And those values were the same across the, all of the zones because they were all recording back what was coming through from the, at the global zone layer. Um, and that was also, also inside there, those medicine and PD daemons were also having issues with walking the interface table because there was a lot of data that they had to wait for as, as it went off into the kernel to process, get the, the interface stats and, and stuff. Um, so I just wanted to be able to at least be able to get that kind of information back to us because we couldn't, uh, <coughs> otherwise it wouldn't, as, a, as an administrator, it would make it very difficult for us to be able to identify who was causing a problem on our system with, without having to log in and always be up there continually monitoring things. Um, so as part of the work for doing this, uh, we made a couple different custom resources so that when you would go to the resource graphs, you would see them as, as a distinct uh, label versus beyond just the um, interface type or, uh, or node, S at, uh, node SNMP level. And wrote a couple different, put things in as a, a couple different collection packages so that the Solaris global zone would show stuff there. And then also that for the NESA, for the, for the zones themselves, that they would have a different measure of collections that would go through. So this is an example of what, what the, of, a, of the global zone collection that we put in place. Um, I changed around the, the default RRD strategy because I wanted to record longer, I wanted to record the five minute agri, five minute collection values over a longer period of time. By default, I think it's a eight week, days. eight days. So in, for the values that I've got up there right now, we store five minute values for 31 days and then we aggregate those up to, to a one hour and store that for one year. Um, it does mean that our RDs are significantly larger than, than the other ones, but uh, kind of find that for at least when you're wanting to get in there and look at some of the things for the, for the past 30 days, we're able to get in there and, and more easily pinpoint certain points in time where we can go back and look at other other logs that are out there. Uh, the XML source gives you a URL that you want to be able to fetch your data from. The, uh, 
using an HTTP request here, and that's going through the Apache HTTP client libraries. There's also file-based uh, parsing, um, file requests, and there's a 3GPP, which will do, I believe it's a type of SSH connection into the system to to pull the what? SCP. SCP. Um, the, uh, there's a few different tags that'll be replaced in the string. Um, IP adder is the one that I've got on here, and this is for the interface that it's doing the collection from. Uh, we were running a web server on a different port from default. That's why it's uh, 13161. And then it just gave the file that we wanted that it was recording stuff to. And so, as I said before, this file is being continually written, written to, and replaced on a on a 60-second cycle on our server. And it, it was kind of nice to do it that way because uh, by doing it with a, a symbolic link to the file, we were able to actually store data over a period of the day and be able to go back and look at those files. And that was, I, I went and did that because as I was encountering the time <coughs> when I was getting these data collection outages because they couldn't process the whole file, I really wanted to go back and see, well, where, where was that, process, uh, that problem happening from? The, um, also give an example of, a, of the using the XSLT to pre-process the file after it's been pulled down from the server. Um, one of the issues I found there was that if the file is significantly large, it takes significantly long to process the file. And so giving a, a, a simple XSL file to strip out different values and stuff from the file was able to shrink the file down significantly before I was able to uh, for the final parsing, um, and then give the uh, data collection file for what what it is. So this is where I'm pulling in the the actual files of, of what things look like and stuff there. So I've got uh, HR storage replacement that I'm using there and I'm recording all of the values that you would normally see from if you were doing HR storage via SNMP. Um, also recorded the, swear, the load average from the system that I had written to uh, some of the CPU usages and stuff. Uh, the bottom two are a little bit more useful for looking at the different Solaris zones and recording how much memory each of them were using, how much CPU each of those were individually getting. Solaris, for some reason, didn't push that data back up into the individual zones. So I had to be able to go in, and the only way to, to analyze which Solaris zone was, was using CPU on a system was at the, at the global zone layer. So it was... Uh, <coughs> pretty interesting there. Um, at, as part of this, you do have the different, uh, the, you're able to index some of the values. So that was where, with the Solaris zones, I've got them indexing off of the, uh, off of the zone, la off the label of the zone. And so that's stored under a different direct, under a subdirectory under, under the, the storage there and they create their own RRDs. Um, so these are a couple different examples of the graphs then that I end up creating for this. The uh, graphs on the left are look like your standard NetSNMP ones with uh, load average and overall usage of the system. And as you see, there's a couple red spikes in the system there. Sure. 
so with uh, yeah, with the graphs there, it was uh, it was nice to be able to get those those graphs there, and, and our users tend to use this page that we've got set up quite a bit, so they're always on the on the lookout for when the red spikes are happening, and then. The other issue then that we run into then is they want to know who is consuming the resources on the system. And that's that's an issue that I have yet to really find a, a, a good solution for. Um, on a system that has very few zones, as in these examples we've got two of them that have just three on three zones on each of them, you're able to actually include them on on a graph and be able to identify easily which particular ones ones are there. These graphs are for our, our database servers, so that was why it was easier for us to do, be able to minimize which set of servers are being shown. And uh, but with our with our bigger zone servers having with them having 120 zones, it's a little more difficult to be able to identify over the last 15, 20 seconds or 20 minutes which which of the zones were the ones that were taking up the significantly significant amount of time over over the system. I haven't really expanded out into other areas with these with the graphs and stuff. Um, Pretty much, these were the the limits of of what I needed to get at with with the data and stuff. Um, I thought about at one point in time of going through and trying to replicate everything that was in <coughs> that SNMP with this model of putting it all into an XML file and being able to pull it all down from the server, but uh, you, know, you get to a point where you get enough data in there and it's like, okay, that's enough for me right now. I get what I want. Um, so that was uh, an interesting thing for me to work on for, as part of my first initial foray into, into uh, OpenMS. Ended up putting this, the, the page on the OpenMS server and one other thing, it doesn't show it here, but uh, I'd actually used the uh, by the server names on the graphs on the left, you could actually click them and they would expand down and show a list of all of the Solaire zones that were running under that global zone. So I was thinking, gee, that'd be nice for people to be able to use to identify which Solaire zone was running under a particular server if they needed to know that. One of the, so one of the things that I worked on over the past couple of months was getting e EMC Unisphere data into OpenMS. Um, unfortunately, EMC is one of those companies that has a proprietary interface for getting information off of the system. They've got, they've got their own analyzer that you can run and it'll you know, collect performance metrics and stuff, but if you don't pay them, they don't give you a, an encrypted <coughs> way of being able to, to get in and view, it, view that data. Um, there is no SNMP agent that they run that is available for you to connect to and pull data off of. So the only method you really have for doing, for getting data off of the EMC is to use your command line utility uh, Navisec CLI. There was an older version of it was that was also just called the analyzer. It will export the data out into either text or XML, and I say sim-like, sim-like because that's the output that it looks. It is. It's just uh, straight XML, and what was in the text version is what it is essentially putting out in the XML version. So I wrote a custom Perl script to parse the XML data and put it into a pattern that I could use for, for the XML collector. The, the sim data that it's put, pulling out doesn't, would not 
aggregate things under the particular. So for uh, for example, on, on the disk array, you have multiple buses for I/O for the getting to your your SAN network or getting to the backend disks on on the array. You have different uh, disks that are out there. All of that would be jumbled into one big stream of data and the XML in, in that XML and so you would have to parse that with a different uh, style sheet to, to actually get it to display into different lists of things. Um, so it, was, it wasn't really, I'm not sure whether I like parsing it as, X, as XML or or par parsing it as, as straight text. Um, I guess both of them have their pluses and minuses. Um, but being that if you have a disk array with a large number of disks, uh, gets to be a little bit of a, a process hog as it's parsing all of that data and push, pushing it out to bigger ones. Now, so with the disk array with Eight buses and running with five, six, seven hundred disks, you run into an issue where that's a very large data file on the order of 20 meg for the file size. And so parsing that and processing that inside at OpenMS is, can be kind of slow. Um, on average, it was taking about a minute and a half to part and process all of that data and persist it out to, to disk. Uh, so this was what I ended up using for the data collection for the, for the EMCs, showing uh, I have a path on my local disk where I'm writing the files out to and each of them have their own specific groups as far as what kind of data and stuff I'm going to pull in from them. So then, just have a, for example for the storage processor of how heavily utilized it is and how much uh, me overhead in the memory that it has available for being able to pull back from the, the system. And then showing the graphs of when we've got the things running. So as you can see, we have a problem in our system from about midnight to about 5 in the morning when we essentially run out of cache on the system and we're essentially having to go right straight to disk, um, which as you all probably would guess that causes performance problems because you can't write out to disk and that slows down things at the database servers where they're unable to have very performant transactions with the storage and stuff. An earlier project that I had worked on with the XML collector was was iPlanet. We yes David? Are you taking questions? You can ask questions. Okay. Um, back on the collection configuration factors, is that this one or uh, the first? Yeah. So one XML source that every disk array is all these sources. Is that <coughs> what's uh, yeah, so I, I have in the uh, in the collect D configuration, it's showing the uh, a second here. Oh, I see. I said EMC Unisphere.
So does that answer the question? Uh, yeah, the, 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 I don't have it, uh, pulled up. I don't up. see it, that, that was something you had to do. Yeah, yeah. In the previous uh, example, you had an XSLT process that did that. Correct. And I just wondered if there was, there was a reason for one of the other case. Um, I had, I didn't use the XSLT, um, I'm not very familiar with using XSLT. Mm -hmm. um, I'd written the, the Perl script to process the EMC data and and push that out. Uh, and I just found that it was easier getting you had, to, you had to write that Perl script anyway, right? So you might as well write it the way you wanted it. Correct, correct. And I, I didn't really know that the XSLT part was out there and that mm -hmm. was something that Alejandro had Glued me into a little while later on, and and that was with with the the Solaire stuff. I was I was running into an issue there where some of the, the the timings of how long it was taking to do things and stuff. So I finally went in there and said, "Well, I'm recording back and sending back a whole bunch of data here in the file. Mm -hmm. I might as well throw out all the stuff that I'm not going to be using." And so right. by putting that in place, that helped to to speed up the process. Quite a bit because then it it shrunk the the original data size down from the the other one. Uh, okay, that's all I have. Mm -hmm. I know I would forget my question by the time you get to that. Yeah. So then. Um, The, as part of the, what what I do at BI Worldwide, we run a bunch of websites for for our customers and stuff, and so we're still using iPlanet as our as our external web server that we funnel all of the uh, processing and stuff through instead of Apache, which probably helped us this week. Um, but uh, and. One of the nice things that's available with iPlanet was that we were able to to get access to the some of the information about how the web servers were, were handling requests and everything. Uh, what one of the issues that we ran into with, run, with our environment was we would always get we would get to a point where we would occasionally get these these random pauses in application processing and our users would come to us and say, well, what's going on here? Why is, why are we getting alerted that the web servers aren't responding? And so it was always kind of a bit of consternation for us to be sit there saying, well, we're not getting alerted by the web servers because they're, they're all up and running. You know, we've never had seen them that they're down. And then it would also go back to, uh, you know, we'd look at them, then we'd look at the application servers, and we'd look at the database servers, and we'd say, well, gee, everything's running running just fine. So this is where we added in uh, iPlanet to the, uh, using it with the XML collector, and we were able to then I use that to identify where things are at. Now, being that it is a web server, and if you're also running a significantly large number of virtual servers, uh, you know, your, again, your data set size is going to be um, significantly large. Uh, very much like if you were using a F5 load balancer or a Citrix NetScaler, where you're running a, a large number of virtual servers on there for uh, different websites and stuff that you're running. So. Uh, and just have another example of the data collection that we were using for it. Um, this this time actually show being able to give a an additional request header out to 
the server as, as it's doing the, the HTTP GET from the server. Um, that was uh, that was something that uh, the initial version of the XML collector didn't have, and then was added in at a at a later time. Um, so that that was another uh, evidence of a. Uh, useful improvements to that the XML collector has gone through over over time here. And then uh, pulling down much more different data sets as you can see a few different things. It's it's actually kind of kind of neat in the in the bottom in the the third from the top where I'm doing the, the thread counts because that's actually doing a XPath Expression uh, on on the data that's coming in from the XML. So it's actually going through and saying sum up a count of all of the numbers of these that are sitting out there. So it's it's actually pretty powerful being able to get that instead of having to go through machinations after the point of of that. Um, and then that uh, goes into the different types of were some graphs showing exactly what's going on there. So uh, with the graphs, um, the iPlanet servers just have a have a level of what they will rise to as the total number of uh, threads that they'll expand to, and uh, it will increment and uh, other ones over over time. And uh, it was uh, pretty useful for us here because once we had this in place, what we were able to identify was that uh, most of the time the pro problem wasn't in the web servers, it was always in the application servers and being able to go through there with the different types of, um, that's the, where the thing, where the requests were being, being hung up because they were usually, we would usually see a very large jump in the little bit of red stack I think on the uh, every time you see that one of them jump up to uh, another plateau of ser uh, servers, there's usually a little bit of red that's that's in there. But uh, anyways, that's uh, pretty much what I'm done with as far as XML collection. So it was uh, it was kind of fun being able to uh, help get the XML collector into the, to the state that it's at right now. So um, it helped, uh, it's helping us be able to, to go through and look at things here. Questions? Do you have that um, on the wiki? Uh, uh, there is a page on the XML collector on the, on the wiki. I, I don't believe it has all of the the, the stuff that I've done in Cypher. Um, you know, I what I found for that was just uh, going over to uh, you know just searching for XSLT on Google and and getting that, and um, that was able to tell me where uh, help me do that. But as far as what that amounted to was um, actually. Should have been So all that that I was doing with the, XM, uh, the incoming X XSL is, is basically saying this is what I want to what I want to keep, and then all of the ones down the bottom was all the stuff that I wanted to to strip out. So you know it it helped because uh, with the DOM model it just it's. The, the overhead that it includes for processing and stuff was was there, but uh, it was uh, I don't know I'm not as a as a Unix admin going in and trying to figure some of this stuff out. It was kind of um, I, 
found it kind of odd how some of this, how they would choose to do some of these things instead of um, there. Uh, you kind of end up with the model of either I'm going to define everything that I want to spit out and I'll do all of that, or as I show here, being able to say this, I'll include everything and if I want to strip it out, I'll do it this way. But, uh, Other questions? The I plan did it, you said I didn't have to use it. It had XML X4 built in. Yes. Yeah, there's a, a statistics module that you just have to enable inside of it and then it would um, you hit a particular URL and you get those stats. Correct, correct. And so this is this I like could pay because Yeah, I think so. I mean, yeah, it wasn't, uh, could add that. Although I'm not sure how many people are still using iPlanet. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but at least it's a good example, right? You know. Yeah. And you never know. I mean, that's the thing that, you know. I wonder what, uh, why iPlanet had that interface. I mean, is there another product that they have, or was there some other customer that maybe said, hey, we want XML and why? Yeah, I know they they have a uh, a uh, SNMP agent that they include along with iPlanet, so uh, you could also use that. Uh, issues that I ran into that was that that agent you, um, you had to run the own. There was a master agent that it included, and then there was also a sub agent that it included. But the problem I had with the master agent was that or with the sub-agent was that it wouldn't link in over the, the smuck socket into, oh. to, so yeah, so I had to actually put it in as a different port and then uh, ran the, the master agent on a different port and so you could do a, uh, do the proxy right. to, to that MIB to, to get those values through there. But then again, you know, you run into issues of, of sucking down 400, four or 500 web servers, and the data set size got grew to be very large and stuff. So being able to grab it all in one XML file was it was pretty quick for for pulling it through there. Um, and then it meant uh, when the the SNMP agents that would iPlanet would start up also meant that they didn't, if they weren't running, I wasn't getting any data collection from them. So that was kind of a pain to have to adjust some of the, the startup scripts for being able to get those processes up and running and make sure that they were always up and running. So. That's cool. I, I was, we were working with a customer that created this XML collector and I was like, Make it, right? <laughs> and now to see it, it looks really great. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I've kind of found that with the XML collector out there, it's able to do ev everything that NetSNMP could do. And I, just in my mind, it was a whole lot easier to process it that way than it was. Oh, I really like that XPath expression. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, yeah. That's, that's got a lot of power, yeah. Uh, for people, I always yell at once because uh, the person says you should never parse HTML with regular expressions. Yeah. Because it should be perfectly formatted next to it. So yeah. technically, you should never be using that subplot. I just said, well, as long as your web page is perfectly formatted, you can use that. Yeah, and that's, that's where I believe uh, I haven't done anything using the HTTP collection side inside the, um, with the XML collector, but uh, I know that it's available out there. Um, the, uh, probably the, the biggest problem that I've been having with the XML collector is just that it takes 
significantly long to process some of the input files and stuff that I'm sending into it. Um, but you made an improvement to that, right? Correct. So yeah. yeah, sort of come, hopefully, you know. Yeah. Probably a dev jam, actually. Yeah, I just... Well, well, it's not contributed yet. Yeah. Not contributed yet. No, what, it, what I... What so, so, yeah, what... what Part of uh, the XML collector and the, the handlers is that you can actually give it a, a file to say this is how I should process the file and everything as, as I'm reading it in and stuff. So the in it is possible then to replace the, the the DOM instead of processing it with a DOM to actually parse it with you could probably parse it with a as a straight XML stream, but uh, I found that the VTD XML library out there has support for XPath, and I uh, was able to to figure out a way to process, be able to process the data using the using VTD XML, and that it would actually go through in there. And I was when I when I first got that working, I was kind of surprised at what was going on because I thought something was wrong because you don't have something go from running in 90 seconds to 4 seconds and go you know just the order of magnitude difference in the processing speed it was like okay is something wrong here am I missing something but, but I mean it was it was pretty amazing to see to see that in and just see see the collections just drop down and, and now the CPU yeah it's significantly less CPU um as far as uh, disk I/O kit or anything like that, I didn't really notice it too much on the server then, because you know instead of it having, a, I mean, you're still at one point in time having to process all of the file and persist it out to disk, um, whether it does it after 90 seconds or right away, it was still. How big are those files? Um, I think the. The disk files were on the order of 20 megabytes in in XML, um, and even that's pretty. You know, there's going to be a lot of replication in the file just because you're going to have there's um, EMC orders everything. So there's a there's a bus that everything is on. There's an enclosure that everything is in, and then there's a drive number. So each each enclosure has 14 disks that are in that particular chassis and I think we're we're into I think we're in our third or fourth rack of, of disks. But what was, what's interesting is that's the way that we've seen a lot of systems expose data, right? Yeah. With XML. Um, and so for instance I know UCS is that way, Cisco UCS and uh, uh, VMware as well to some degree. Mm -hmm. So why did you have to do this you didn't have something from EMC that did this um, well, you have the EMC analyzer. However, it's like like anything else. Your your data set size gets to a certain point, and the system takes significantly long just pulling all of that data in. So, so we we we're running the analyzer, and I could go back and look at the the analyzer there. But it would getting real time information out of it was extremely kludgy because you go in and it's like, okay, I'm going to go out and I'm going to grab all of my statistics for all of the disks and stuff that were out there and you know, I'd go through and say I'm going to have to pull in you know, the 5,000 plus metrics to be able to build my graph for what, sh what I should make available for you to go look at. So all the EMC customers out there like you don't have this don't have a solution unless they do something like this. That's changing, I'll say that. I just, no, met, I just, with, yeah, I just met with them in the last week and they I, I saw a different product. Well, forget, forget the changing part. I mean, yeah. That, that but yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, that's, I, that's just I personally was struggling with that too up in, you yeah, know. Well, I mean, and that's, I mean, I think there's some people that uh, were able to work out how to get the metrics and stuff out available. The whole side too. Yeah, via, um, S and MP and stuff, but I, 
the, I mean, as, as big as the they, market is, I would say they you also package that up and go everywhere with it, right? You know, something yeah. all over the beat. Well, and they also they like to charge you for being able to get the yeah. the metrics off. So I mean, I if we weren't no, I think we would still be able to get all the, the metrics because I'm pulling them from yeah. from the command line. Yeah, yeah. My so like for instance, the, the predicament I'm in is that I can pull a collection report out of there, but it's encrypted. I have to then ship it to my reseller, and then they can run it for me and then ship it back to me. But you could use this. Oh yeah, absolutely. We've been talking. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully, well, hopefully, time that, that hopefully by now I, I'm on a different array. Right, but I mean, but all this time you've not had this kind of tool for your EMC environment. That just seems crazy to me. Yeah, I've had some pounding my fist on the table meetings with these guys. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. I mean, you look at you look at what you know what Ron's done with these these three examples and, and the two that I presented earlier, is that that uh, even if, even if these vendors are are, uh, I mean, I don't almost call it hostile. To get the data, there, there are ways to do it, and and the wonderful thing is there's a lot of framework. You know, we, as I kind of started out the the afternoon with is you know OpenOS is really a framework for getting this data, and as you heard David talk this morning, that's kind of the direction of things. You know, it's, let's let's enable all these these you know solutions to get the strange data because they don't necessarily want us to for some reason. <laughs> they don't want to help us out, or they want to charge us too much to do it. Well, they're in the hardware business, right? They don't yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the other thing is that sometimes they're not the, they develop a tool, they don't do a very good job of it. They don't know what, you, what they're looking for. You know, it's like, uh, you know, um, as Kevin was talking about, you know, they don't know what they want. You know, the customer doesn't, you know, they talk to a customer, customer says, I don't know. And so they just give it a world and that's not exactly what you, what you want. As I said, I looked at EMC's new tool, it still doesn't give me what I want. I mean, it's, I, from the standpoint of, uh, it's a lot of raw data, but now at least I have the raw data, yeah. so I can go somewhere. Um, and if I have specific problems, I can home in on those. Um, yeah, so we're kind of open, gonna open this up to see if anybody else had some more questions in general about this or other ideas or other things maybe they're trying to wrestle with right now um, that Ron and I can kind of maybe give you some pointers on where to, where to get the information to help you get that or maybe give you a good <coughs> start on it. As far as far as what do you mean by that? I mean, because um, it was it's pretty much just a, a straight text dump. So I would say, you know, this is disk bus zero and closure zero, disk fourteen, it's, and then it would lift off list off the, the the metrics that it was recording, the number of, of reads, the number of writes, the number of Blocks read the number of, of, of that. So I mean, it was the text was pretty pretty straightforward and clear on what what it was. What's um, what protocol are you using to connect to the command line? I cron script. But you got to talk to the NaviSec. Uh, EMC provides a, a tool called uh, NaviSecFi. Uh -huh. It's it's just a, a Binary that they provide as as a package that you you install on the server, and then your your application uses that to make a connection and grab correct the data correct yeah and, and and back to the point yeah I think it is a lot of reverse engineering on a lot of these I think I think you know the good news XML you know, is kind of self descriptive um, you know both the good and the bad of it uh, so you can kind of read it a little bit and 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 get some data out of it pretty quickly that way is there an XSD or DT I don't think I've seen one. I, not not for any of the stuff that I was looking at. So maybe that's what Ian uh, yeah, uh, was asking. That maybe the, the, the vendor had an ox like that that you could have asked for. I, when I was searching on PowerLink, I wasn't finding anything. Yeah. So there wasn't anything there. to, And even when I was looking at some of the, the support forums for some of that stuff, there wasn't, people were not... There, nothing was being provided that would be able to get people back to 
to useful information and stuff on that. So yeah, there, I mean that's it's, we, I could vent about EMC for an hour, but the the gist of it is is that they 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 tend to like to remain closed. They like to sell services. They like to, you know, I can't replace a disk in my array. They have to come out and do it for me. You know, <laughs> so it's it, you know it's 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 a different mentality. Um, I'm new to the storage world, so I have a lot of complaints about it. <laughs> That must be a proprietary protocol. Then. Uh, it, it used to, they used to ship a jar, I know, and yeah. now it's a binary. And I, I'm, yeah, it's proprietary to me, as far as I can tell. I haven't actually put a sniffer on the wire to see what it's doing, but. You're kidding. Yeah. I haven't done that yet. I'll get there. <laughs> Slowing down. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that kind of goes back to the question of, yeah. Of getting the data off of the systems and stuff, and that was, um, you know, I, I went the route of having a cron job because that way I knew that I could have it generate me a file every 60 seconds or whatever, and I think I have it going every five minutes or something. But being able to get that kind of data over over that amount of time, and then um, and then it's just a matter of changing a similar kind of server at a point in time, and then I'm never, and then at least open it. Was, OpenMS is always able to collect some kind of data, whether it's whether it's always good or not. It's there, but. Uh, I think the other questions are already Other questions? <laughs> I was going to loop back on. You know, so we talked about the SMPD exact. You know, so that's it's a great way to do something. You know, real quick, and you know that's a very predictable thing. You know, but it's. As Ron said, you know, if, if it's if something that might take a while or, or anything like that, then you're, you're going to get yourself in, into a pickle pretty quick. Um, the other one I want to talk about was I didn't talk about the the general purpose uh, monitor. Um, again, you know, it's 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 a shell script outside, so you know, use with caution. And I even say that with the BSF monitor too that I was, that I showed earlier. Uh, you know, you want you don't want these things to be long things that you might get yourself. You might, might might just make yourself a bigger mess. Mm -hmm. um, and that's always the thing with anything like this. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Anybody else have have a, a solution that they'd like to share, or possibly a problem they'd like to solve that we can help out with? Can yeah, if you could. All right. Graham Fowler. I'm one of the systems infrastructure team at Loughborough University um, and I moved into there in August after eight years, well, seven and a half years of managing another team which had uh, shrunk away till there was only two of us. Um, the systems infrastructure team manage storage and server infrastructure within the university. Primarily um, they focused on Windows servers because Linux people have all been in other teams. Um, but I'm one of those, and I've moved into SI, and they've suddenly gone, ooh, here's a guy with some other skills. Um, we've got a rotting um, solar winds install that was used by two or three teams to monitor networks, switches, routers, other devices, servers, services, websites, but the guy who ran it moved on to another job, and nobody ever took on the responsibility. So there was a, a great deal of 
discomfort with the fact that we didn't really have a, an overview of the systems that were being monitored properly. Um, and I was given a job by my new boss to replace it and to try and replace it quickly and try and replace it cheaply. And because I've used OpenNMS before, it was the perfect candidate. So out of the box, it took me two days from uh, a clean install, writing a provisioning script to query our vCenter database, pull in loads of VMs and some things that are outside the, the virtual infrastructure um, and get the basics up and running. So we've got 318 nodes, 390 addresses being monitored, interfaces being monitored. Um, if I just pull up the node list, there's a nice long list of various database servers and web servers and application servers. And just here, that's, that's all our hardware blades, um, which is all Cisco UCS. But prior to moving, I was managing a quite large web infrastructure and had a load of cobbled together RRD pages, some using Moonin, some that I'd handwritten, that monitored um, how the performance of the web servers. Um, and decided that I'd use the openness that the net SNMP extend um, command to wrap around a little Perl script that queries Apache's um, extended status, parses the output, and then spits out a load of useful data for us, which I've then munged down into graphs that look like they come from Moonin, if anyone's ever used that. So there they are. This is our corporate uh, database front end. Sorry, web, web front end with the university's main website on it. Um, and that's showing us exactly what the performance is like at the moment. So how busy it is, how many idle servers we've got, how much headroom. Um, and we've seen in the last few months where the new prospectus was released and we had a, a doubling of hits in a single day. Um, but we didn't get near the ceiling. And actually the ceiling there is the default for a, an Apache 2.2 server, um, we can probably go to five to maybe eight times that if we need to on the same VM. Um, or we can also deploy additional, we've got two VMs, one of which is in standby, and we can scale out sideways with it. Um, but we've never really had this, this detail before, um, even though we had it with Moon and people were watching it, it was just in the background. And now this is being actively monitored by several other people. Um, and that was, that was fairly easily done with, <coughs> I'll just go and look in see that the, the names there, if you're familiar with Apache's extended status output, they correlate perfectly with that. So that's being found, that's only being collected from the machines which we've decided to extend. And in each of those, if I'll just jump back off this one, here that's defining we're extending, we're calling it Apache which gives us the leading part of the OID and then the script to run and the script itself um, isn't rocket science it's been uh, cribbed heavily from somebody else's um, but basically, it, um, it stores the uh, data in a cache, so if you query it too quickly, you just get back the data that's already been collected. Um, and because we've got several different installs at the top there, we've got an array of URLs that it will try in order. So that's a specific one for a customised module that we've got. That's the default. And that people can set up their servers in different ways. 
um, there's two sets of documentation doing the rounds. So rather than trying to get them all to standardise on one, we just iterate through them. And if we ever change it, we can add another one into there. Um, and it just it just parses the output from the machine readable form and spits the numbers out so we can collect it. Oh. Anyone else? Anyone else have anything? Well, we're going to wrap a little early then. Um, again, I, I'll be around all day tomorrow. Ron will be around as well. Um, and tonight, you know, or anything else, if anybody else has questions for us, we're more than willing to help out. Um, you know, if you weren't familiar with some of these things, hopefully you learned some things. So anybody, I have quick questions though. So anybody thinking about something, extending SNMPD, is that something that might have triggered something for people? How about uh, the uh, BSF monitor? Anything? No? I'll take some XML collector? Okay, good. Good, 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 good. And, uh, you know, we're always, I, I know Ron's on IRC almost all the time, and I'm on IRC periodically. So if you have questions, you know, feel free to reach out to us. We're more than willing to help out. Uh, um, you saw my email, you know, so if you, if you want to shoot me an email, I'm not so good about reading Discuss anymore, so <laughs> good luck there. <laughs> um, and you can always ping me on uh, Google as well. All right, thank you. Thank you.